Welcome back. This lecture on copy editing and proofreading, along with your assigned reading, form the foundation for your discussion post this week. It's also very important um, in helping you get ready for the comprehensive edit project. So let's get started. All right, so I'm going to um, introduce 10 principles for copy editing, explore how to determine the scope of a copy edit, as well as effective processes for both copy editing and proofreading, and finally, explain how and when to mark copy. Let's begin with principles. Most of what I'll say about copy editors in this lecture applies to proofreaders as well. I'm going to borrow from Mike Pope, a technical editor with decades of experience, to provide you with a list of the overarching principles of copy editing. Mike wrote about these 10, plus a few more, on his blog in 2013. The link to that post is in the To Learn More area of Canvas, and it's worth exploring on your own. Although this lecture is not precisely organized around each of these principles, I'll mention all of them at some point, and I'll show them to you again at the end of the lecture. As for the first two principles, I'll simply say that the copy editor must understand as much as possible about the audience for the material in order to make good editorial decisions, and it's the editor's job to be a stand-in for the reader or user of the content they edit. Now let's move on to determining the scope of a copy edit. Why should a copy editor worry about scope? Remember the story I told you about Richard Aden's copy edit of a book manuscript and the author's dissatisfaction with the ultimate quality of the product? I told you there were two lessons I wanted you to get from Aden's story. The first is make the responsibilities of the author and editor as explicit as possible before beginning any editing project. You can do that in part by referring to the levels of edit in a proposal or a contract. The second lesson is nicely stated by Aiden himself. In other words, never take responsibility for the overall level of content quality as an editor. Instead, take responsibility for the appropriate level of quality given the constraints you were asked to work within. Novice freelance editors continuously ask, what's the going rate for editorial work? And experienced freelancers, those who've been able to make a living, continuously answer, it depends. So that you think about estimating in a concrete way, I'm going to show you a table with editorial rates from the Editorial Freelancers Association, or EFA, which even they recognize as flawed. The first column represents scope. There's basic copy editing, also sometimes referred to as light editing, there's heavy copy editing, developmental, what we've been calling structural. Then the second column represents time, with basic copy editing estimated to be the least time consuming and developmental editing the most, heavy copy editing somewhere in the middle. Note that using pages per hour is one of the flaws in these estimates. Much has been written about this, but I'm not going to cover it here. The third column represents cost, with basic copy editing estimated at the lowest hourly fee, developmental the highest, and heavy in the middle. I hope that you're thinking these columns are related to the triple constraints on quality that I've already talked about in many previous lectures. The triple constraints make it clear that scope, time, and cost are interrelated. If you change one, the others change. If you edit more quickly than I do, then you can either increase the scope of your edit and keep the time the same, or you can keep the scope the same and cut the time. In an effort to be more helpful, I'm giving you a list of the major things that affect scope. Both levels and degrees of edit were reflected on the EFA estimates. One thing that their estimates do not reflect is differences for different types of material. A single physics article with multiple tables and figures and equations is going to take longer to copy edit than a single recipe in a cookbook. Before I move on, I want to make sure you understand that there is no such thing as a going rate for editorial work. 
If you want to make a living as a freelancer, you must charge what Richard Aiden calls the effective hourly rate. That's a calculation only you can make based on your income needs. The link to Aiden's guidance is in the To Learn More folder in Canvas. Given the time constraints an editor must work within, they must prioritize their work. Editorial triage is a term coined by Amy Einson, author of The Copy Editor's Handbook. She advises using your editorial time wisely by saying, the copy editor's first task is to ask the editorial coordinator to help set priorities. Which editorial tasks are the most important for this particular project, and which niceties must fall by the wayside? That coordinator might be either your boss or your client. Although there is no way to generalize about what the priority should be for all copy editing jobs, this is a good time for me to say a little about the results reported in your assigned reading for this module. UNT's Ryan Bedger studied 55 editing tests given to candidates for tech writing jobs. Those tests represented companies in 21 states and 9 industries. They're not tests for editors, per se, but they nicely represent the way non-traditional publishers think about the necessary skills of those whose job role includes writing technical content. The table I'm showing you presents a few of the errors covered in your assigned reading. The most common error type found in editing tests was the use of a wrong word. There are two examples here. In the first, the material uses a homophone, allegory, instead of what we assume is the correct word, allergy. Best practice would be that you might make the change yourself and then query the author to ensure you didn't change the intended meaning. In the second example of a wrong word error, the material includes a preposition that doesn't agree in number with the noun that follows it. In other words, between should be replaced with among because there are three firms. Best practice would be that you make the change. There's no reason to query the author in this case. The table also displays a type of misspelling error commonly found on these tests. The name of the company administering this test is spelled with an S. If writers or editors do not identify and correct spelling of a potential employer, they're not likely to get a job. Bedger's study identified a few other common errors on these tests, but a great deal of variation. What I'm showing you in this table represents a few of the errors TechCom professionals said they were most bothered by. Not all of these were common among the tests, but it seems wise for you to know what they are. The first an apostrophe error. The example I'm showing incorrectly uses an apostrophe to create the plural of an abbreviation. It should look familiar. It appeared in the material you copy edited on your diagnostic test. The second error type is misspelling. In particular, professionals were bothered by misused homonyms. In this example, it's without an apostrophe is used where the contraction for it is should appear. The third error type is a sentence fragment. The example I'm showing you is an incomplete sentence. It lacks a subject and a main verb, but it's punctuated with a period. The final error type in this table is a logic error. The example from Bedger's article states that there are three methods, but lists four. Although there's much we cannot predict about the test administered to an individual applicant for a tech comm job, we can conclude that the errors I've listed in the last two slides should be a priority for anyone preparing for such a test. Bedger's findings about how tests are administered are also of importance to job seekers at non-traditional publishers. I haven't said much about proofreaders because I don't anticipate this is going to be a career choice for any of you, but you should know that proofreaders check items that are created during typesetting. Things like page numbers, table of contents, maybe an index, uh, issues with layout like widows and orphans. Proofreaders also fix mechanical errors they find, like misspellings. One of the reasons I'm not saying more about the proofreader's work is that only in a traditional publishing environment will you find someone with that actual job title. In non-traditional publishing, the same individuals who do the copy editing also handle proofreading when it happens. I'll say a little more about this later in the lecture. Even though everyone recognizes the different levels of edit represented by copy editing and proofreading, you should be aware that, as with all editorial roles, people use terms differently.
Now that you have some idea of what copy editors and proofreaders look for while they edit, it's time to look into the processes they use to do their work. I've already made the point that there's no way to generalize about what the priority should be for all copy editing or proofreading jobs. I've also made the point that copy editors must know what style guide applies to the specific material they're editing. But what do they do when they don't remember how to use apostrophes, or how capital letters are used in the company name, or whether you can use capital or lowercase p for probability and statistics? Simple. They look it up. Copy editors consider their dictionary, grammar usage guide, and Google among their most important tools. The key is to use the reference listed in your style guide. Hopefully, that reference represents the most accurate source of information about whatever you don't know. You should expect to use references during your copy editing process. I should probably start by making clear there is no single process. Each copy editor finds what works for them. But I'm going to show you two workflows from professional editors as a way to help you develop your own process. The first comes from Paul Beverly. It was published on The Parlor. Beverly is a technical author, publisher, proofreader, and editor with more than 30 years of experience. His clients include both traditional and non-traditional publishers. So here's his overall process. First, read through the material to get an overview. Then, go through the material to edit for style, things like word choice, conciseness, tone, etc. Third, go through the document to fix mechanical errors, things like spelling, punctuation, spacing. Fourth, read through the material again with a focus on the meaning to ensure you didn't introduce errors as a result of your copy edits. Finally, double check the mechanics, like spelling and spacing again. What you should notice is that Beverly does multiple passes through the material he copy edits concentrating on one or a couple aspects of the material at a time. The ability to focus on a limited number of things is essential to copy editing. No one can pay sufficient attention to everything about content in one pass. We'll come back to Beverly's process in the next module when we begin looking at Microsoft Word as an editing tool. For now, let's look at another editor's process. Yatindra Joshi has also been copy editing technical and scientific documents for more than 30 years. In Corrigo, that's an e-zine for STC's special interest group on tech editing, he published a piece called Checking the Quality of a Hard Copy Document in 60 Minutes. He did that in response to a common request from the non-traditional publishers he worked for. Take a quick look. Tell me what you think. The process he describes is how he would spend those 60 minutes. His first brief pass through the material is similar to Beverly's, gleaning an overall impression. In Joshi's second pass, he reads selectively to check integrity or accuracy. For example, select a random table and see if you understand what it's about from its title. Then look at several tables in different sections to see if they're presented consistently with mechanics and format. On his third pass, which is the longest, Joshi reads as if he were copy editing it, but he scrutinizes just three pages, three tables, three figures, and, if there's a bibliography, five references selected at random. In Joshi's final pass, he looks at the document's physical attributes, for instance, the printing, the paper, the binding, and then writes up a summary of his findings. Part of the reason I'm sharing Joshi's process with you is to corroborate that all professional editors make multiple passes through the material they edit. The other reason I've shared this 60-minute content quality check with you is that it's an excellent means for estimating the time required to copy edit material. As with copy editing, there is no single proofreading process. Each proofreader finds what works for them but I'm going to show you one workflow from a professional as a way to help you develop your own process. I'm borrowing guidance from Ward Nicholson, who was a typesetter before he began work as a freelance proofreader for ad agencies. Ward warns us, let me state up front that if you are not the sort of person for whom proper written English has pretty much become second nature, 
or for whom spelling and grammatical mistakes tend to be offenses that naturally jump out at you most of the time, you shouldn't subject yourself to the risks of proofreading. I agree with Ward. Proofreading is for those who spot errors naturally, but Ward also makes clear that is a necessary but not sufficient skill. Instead, he supplies us with six proofreading pathways the skilled proofreader must follow. I'm sharing four of them, most relevant to both print and digital content. First, never rush and don't take shortcuts. Follow repeatable procedures every time. Second, maintain your concentration by controlling your reading environment. Turn off notifications, silence your phone. You get the idea. Third, learn how to read the copy as if it were the first time you'd ever seen it, even if you've seen it many times before. This is an attitude and requires diligence to maintain. If you can't do it, take a break from the material for a while. Fourth, don't try to trap all mistakes in just one catch. Divide and conquer by using a separate proofreading pass for each major class of error. If you didn't notice, let me be explicit. All three of the processes followed by experts require multiple passes through the material in which separate categories of elements or errors is your focus. The homework I've assigned you in the RPW workbook helps you practice this skill because each chapter applies to a single aspect of presenting technical information, from developing content to organizing it to creating effective style and fixing mechanics. Structural editing primarily focuses on global ideas or design, developing content and organizing it, but at the macro level. Copy editing focuses mostly on applying the standards in your style guide at the sentence level or below, micro-organizing the words within a sentence or selecting the most appropriate word, making subjects and verbs agree in number, etc. Proofreading focuses on an even more confined level of edit where only mechanics are of interest. You can separate the content any way you want to in your own copy editing or proofreading process, but you must do it. Learning to limit the aspects of content you attend to is critical for success. Now let's dig a little deeper into how to mark copy. If you've never seen material after a copy editor has done their work, you might wonder what their marks look like and what type of marks they make. You've already seen me use them. Those red marks that showed corrections on tech editing tests are called proofreader's marks. Once upon a time, copy editors and proofreaders made these proofreading marks with red pencil on hard copy to denote suggested changes in the material. I'm going to use this nifty graphic created by Dragonfly Editorial to show off some of the copy editor's knowledge. The elements in purple are proofreading marks. Copy editors could use this mark over a character or word to mean deleted. They could use this one with a letter above it to mean insert that letter here. They could use this mark between characters to mean insert a comma here. In addition to deleting and inserting material, copy editors could use marks to suggest changes in white space. For example, this one means start a new paragraph where the mark is placed, or this one to mean insert a space between characters. Some marks signal changes to typeface. For instance, this one's written in the margin on the line where some characters have been underlined in order to signal they should appear in boldface. There are two advantages to proofreader's marks. First, they appear on the copy as suggestions, which can be accepted or rejected. As I hope I've made clear, copy editors do not simply rewrite material. Second, the marks are unequivocal. Everyone in publishing knows what they mean. But digital publishing and the explosion of content being produced by non-traditional publishers has made these marks mostly defunct. Their use continues to decline, so there's less reason for novice editors to learn them. Instead, the copy editor marks suggestions for deletions, insertions, or other changes are made digitally. More about this later. For now, you have some idea what it means for a copy editor to mark copy. Before I say a little about how copy editors do their work, I want you to read this quote from Benjamin Dreyer. Dreyer's the Vice President, Executive Managing Editor, and Copy Chief of Random House. 
Dreyer's not alone in warning copy editors to respect the boundary between editing and authoring, as shown in this quote from Carol Saller, longtime editor of CMOS's online Q&A and author of The Subversive Copy Editor. Remember the gist of your assigned reading in my lecture on editor-author relationships. One way editors damage that relationship is by over-editing. Saller supplies us with another reason why a copy editor should make no edits. In short, do not assume that the author is wrong and you are right. Instead, make your attitude one of do no harm. Let's assume, A, that you have identified something in an author's material that violates the style guide. B, that fixing it is within the scope of the copy edit you've agreed to do. And C, that you're certain it will do no harm. Then how do you communicate those edits to the author or others involved in the publishing process? As I've already mentioned, you could use proofreader's marks on hard copy with red pencil. But for copy editors today, the most common tool is what Microsoft Word calls track changes. When turned on, any changes to the copy show up in different colors or with other typographic clues, which you can customize. Editorial comments or author queries are entered as comments, which appear outside the margin of the material. Using track changes has both of the advantages of proofreader's marks. They appear as suggestions within the material. They can be accepted or rejected, in other words, and their meaning is usually clear. But in addition, track changes are efficient because all the reviewer has to do is click accept and the change is made automatically. The use of Word as an editing tool is our sole focus in the next course module. To understand when proofreaders do their work, I should say a little about how proofreading differs from copy editing. So the essential difference is the stage in the publishing process. Copy editors do the bulk of their work during pre-production, while proofreaders do theirs during production. The proofreader's work begins when materials in its final format. The term derives from the paper publication process in which page proofs are created after typesetters complete their work. Those page proofs are then checked against the copy edited material using the editorial style sheet. Proofreaders do not look at original material submitted by an author and rarely interact with authors. One good thing proofreaders do is think about the domino effects of their edits. Proofreader Louise Harnby explains this way. Every amendment I suggest might have an impact somewhere else. That doesn't mean I shouldn't make the amendment. It means rather that I need to be mindful of the consequences of my actions. Harmby gives the example of recommending that a single line of text that appears at the bottom of a page, an orphan, be moved to the following page. While that will improve the layout of the page with the orphan, it might cause the seventh page after that to have a widowed line that ends a chapter. This is when the proofreader adds a comment, this time to the typesetter instead of the author, letting them know there's a choice to be made about where an orphaned or widowed line appears. As I've mentioned, editing is now done with digital tools because nearly all publishing is digital and often layout is done within some kind of a program like Adobe InDesign. This example shows how editors and proofreaders have adapted by developing proofreading marks that work as stamps in Adobe Acrobat. An international standard for editing marks, ISO 5776, Symbols for Text Correction, was released in 1983 to formalize long-standing industry conventions. These stamps are effective for proofreading, but personally, I wouldn't use them for copy editing for three reasons. First, it's far more time-consuming to add and position these stamps than to enter edits using track changes in Word. Second, if you're sending your copy edits to an author, few will understand what the marks mean. Third, and most important, Someone must still use those marks to make the actual revisions within the material. Before I move on, I should note that proofreaders like editors can make comments or queries, as the proofreader did in the example shown on this slide. In 2020, XML for publishing is standard. Even the 17th edition of CMOS was produced in XML. I don't have time in this lecture to introduce you to it, but I do want to make the point that material in XML also needs to be copy edited. As you can see in this screenshot, XML authoring software, like Madcap Flare, allow track changes. 
The second screenshot shows how an author can accept or reject those changes in much the same way as in Microsoft Word. One unresolved issue with XML, however, is the ability to use marks for suggested revisions in the underlying semantic codes, you know, the primary advantage of using XML. This is recognized by OASIS, the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards, but I'm not aware of any resolution at this point. I began this lecture by introducing you to 10 overarching principles for copy editing. In fact, let me use those principles to summarize for you. The first three apply when a copy editor or proofreader is planning a job. I used a rate schedule to demonstrate how the triple constraints of scope, time, and cost are interrelated. Scope is influenced by levels and degrees of edit, as well as variation for different types of material. The need to prioritize was emphasized when I presented a few of the findings from your assigned reading on the errors found on the editing tests given to screen candidates for TechCom jobs. I talked about numbers four and five while describing three professionals' processes for copy editing or proofreading. All three required multiple passes through the material in which separate categories of elements or errors was their focus. And I made the point that RPW homework provides practice in this skill. Principles six through nine were emphasized while I explained how and when to mark copy. I made the point that proofreader marks are the traditional means of suggesting changes because they're clear and can be accepted or rejected when revising material. Track changes in a digital authoring tool has those advantages and also more efficient because all the reviewer has to do is click accept and the change is made. Principle 10 has been repeated in several lectures, but it deserves emphasis. All editorial roles require a respect for the boundary between editing and authoring. So nearly everything in this lecture should help you when you're doing your comprehensive edit assignment. Joshi's 60-minute quality review might be especially helpful when you're trying to create a proposal and determine what scope of edit you can provide for your client given the time constraints you're under in the class. Mm -hmm.